Perfect. All right. Great, I see some people joining us. Welcome to those of you who are coming into the Zoom room right now. Welcome, welcome. It is three o'clock. We're getting started uh, very shortly here. But for those of you who are just joining us, again, we haven't gotten officially started yet. And um, I'm Val Ross from the New York Wine and Grape Foundation. And we're joined here by Mike Helms. And we're gonna introduce him really quickly um, in a minute but I just wanna say we're both having some internet and some computer issues. So just a little bit of a disclaimer before we get started, we will move forward as best as we possibly can. Um, and so it's 3.01, Mike. So without further ado, um, am I good to get started? And I will uh, kick off a little intro and then hand it over to you. All right, sounds good. Perfect. Awesome. Well, thanks everybody for joining us this afternoon. We're really happy to see you here. Um, this webinar is going to be on managing pesticide drift in vineyards and pesticide recording. So this is another webinar in a series that's brought to you by the New York Wine and Grape Foundation Sustainable Wine Growing Program. We're super excited. This is our first official year in the program. Last year was a successful pilot. Uh, the program is designed to advance environmental, social, and economic sustainability of New York's wine and grape industry through regionally defined sustainability standards, certification, grower education, and stakeholder engagement. So if you haven't already, now is definitely the time to enroll. The program is totally free to all wine and wine grape growers in New York State. The first step after you do enroll is a self-assessment using the latest version of our Vine Balance Workbook. And there's still time. To do that, you can enroll and do your self-assessment before December 31st. Um, and you can learn more at our website at newyorkwines.org slash industry slash sustainability. Um, Justin Jackson, who's our new program manager, is fantastic. He's available to answer any questions you have. Unfortunately, today he's a little under the weather, but he'll be in the office the rest of the week. So feel free to reach out to him. So uh, more about today's session. We're going to have about 90 minutes today here with Mike to discuss concerns related to pesticide drift in vineyards, when pesticide drift may be a problem, and ways to mitigate it. Mitigation options we're going to be talking about include spraying practices to reduce drift, drift management requirements on pesticide labels, and equipment setup and selection. Mike's also going to be touching on pesticide applicator record keeping requirements to meet state and federal requirements. Um, so Mike, we're delighted to have you as our speaker today. Um, we know you're an educator with Cornell Cooperative Extension's Pesticide Safety Education Program or CCE PSEP. Um, PSEP, we're like an acronym. PSEP, Got, we love our acronyms here, so perfect. Um, so Mike coordinates Cornell's on-demand online recertification system. He oversees the publication and review of the Cornell Crop and Pesticide Management Guideline Series, conducts educational programs on pesticide-related issues across the state, and oversees Cornell's pesticide registration program. Um, so again, really happy to have you here. Um, just one quick housekeeping reminder. Um, first, we are in a webinar format today, as you can see, but we encourage you to ask your questions via, via the Q&A tool at the bottom of your screen, although we have a relatively small group, so I believe that if you do have kind of a more um, complex question and you want to unmute yourself, you can send me a note or raise your hand and we'll try to allow you to unmute yourself and we can have a chat. Um, other than that, you can use the Q&A tool at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to go in there. I'll go ahead and allow upvote. So if people really like a question, they can move it to the top of the list, Mike, so you can see it first thing. Um, you can always use the chat feature as well to say hi or send your notes through to Mike or I. Um, and I think that's it in terms of housekeeping. Um, and just a reminder, um, Mike and everyone that's on the call today, we are recording so that we can capture all this great information and send it back out to you in a link, uh, plus any of the copy or any of the handouts that Mike might want to share later. Um, and so now that housekeeping is taken care of and we've survived another shutdown of my laptop, I will hand it over to you, Mike. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Val. Uh, it's good to be here. Hopefully we can keep the technology under control. As I, as I always say, if it wasn't for the technology, it would be a very simple, simple lifestyle. That's for sure. So hey, you've already heard a little bit about me. Let me uh, just give you a little overview of our program. Our program is the Cornell Cooperative Extension Pesticide Safety Education Program, also known as PCCEPSEP. 
And one of our chief responsibilities is to work on uh, training applicant, pesticide applicators in New York State. So those of you that have become a certified applicator have actually had an exposure with our program at some point. Uh, on one of the big projects that we do is we design and uh, develop the pesticide applicator certification training manuals. And so for some of you that may be the green and yellow books and for the or newer folks, it will be the blue and yellow books for certification training. In addition to that, we're a program that's really all things pesticides. So if you ever have a question about pesticide use, pesticide safety, anything along that lines, by all means, contact us at our program. Uh, you can contact me. And if I'm not a, an expert in the question that you've got, I probably got a resource that I could direct you to or find someone that can answer the question for you. So the other thing I also like to say too, is that uh, we, uh, we're not an enforcement agency, we're an educational organization. And so if you ever have a question related to anything that relates to state regulations, federal law, state law, or anything like that, by all means, you can feel free to contact us. Um, we will not share your information with the DEC or any regulatory agency. If we do end up having to answer your question by contacting a regulatory agency, uh, we will never share your name. It will remain anonymous. In fact, I have to do that with some of my extension educators on occasion, even though they're well known within the system. So, like I said, if you ever have any questions related to pesticides, pesticide use, feel free to reach out to us in our program. So now let me share, share my screen here. And hopefully, like I said, the technology is going to uh, continue to work well for us. So at this point, everybody should be seeing a copy of the uh, main page for my presentation. So today, we said we're going to be talking about managing pesticide drift in vineyards and a little bit about pesticide record keeping. So I'm not going to give you all of the answers today. I'm going to give you a few things to think about as you move forward, you know, going through the winter, thinking about the past spray season, maybe give you some ideas to think about as far as uh, changing your spray practices and also maybe to help you with some record keeping issues. So the first thing I'd like to do some shameless promotion for our program, as Bill mentioned in the introduction, I oversee our online distance learning center. And what we have here is it's an online way for applicators to obtain asset applicators recertification credits. And currently we have 35 courses that cover a variety of different topics. Uh, there's some basic core topics that includes things like safety, environment, pesticide handling. Uh, we also have some more category specific trainings in insect management, weed management, IPM, pollinator protection. We even have a couple of courses on application equipment. So if you're seeing where you might need to get an extra credit or two, by all means, if you visit this URL here, pmepcourses.cc.cornell.edu, this is a great place for you to pick up a couple of those credits. And in fact, I've been seeing quite an uptick in, in the online course system, primarily because it's convenient. The courses don't have to be completed at one time. You can log in, start a course, take some time off, and come back to finish that course at a later date. So it's an extremely convenient way of earning a few credits. All right, so with that, let's go into what we're gonna talk about today. So the first session, then we're gonna talk about drift. And under that category, we're gonna look at what drift and overspray are. We're gonna talk about the differences between particle drift and vapor drift. Uh, so give you a few drift management strategies, strategies that you could take back to the vineyard. Talk about selecting equipment, and then uh, we'll have a little discussion about different types of nozzles and how they relate to drift management. At the end of the presentation, we'll talk about pesticide applicator record keeping and some issues that are coming up with that. So without further ado, let's talk about drift. So I would like to start out the drift conversation with this beautiful picture here. This, uh, and feel free to add any, any comments in the chat as I ask questions. I like to ask questions while I'm giving my presentations. So I like, like to have a little bit of engagement with the participants. So if we were to look at this picture here, this is an ideal sprayer setup, correct? Probably some of you are looking at this saying, well, not exactly. So if you look at the what the situation is here, and this was actually a picture that was sent to me by a county extension educator down in the Hudson Valley. And their question was, is this actually a legal pesticide application? So looking at this photo, you would say, well, yeah, maybe. Uh, assuming that the product has been approved for the use, the crop that's being sprayed appears to probably be pumpkins, would be my guess. This is probably a farmer that's using pumpkins as a cash crop and a few extra dollars. And so they're using an air blast sprayer to spray these pumpkins. And as you can see, an incredible amount of drift coming out of that sprayer. The spray is going up into the air. It's possibly drifting off and reaching into the woods that surrounds this field. 
So my response was, is, well, yes, this most likely is a legal application. However, is this an appropriately set up piece of equipment? And the answer to that is no. Um, one, ideally, this farmer probably should be using a boom sprayer to treat that crop, primarily to get that spray closer to the target and to reduce the chance for drift. But if the grower has only an air blast sprayer, you know, what things could be done to modify that sprayer? You know, some things, for example, could be shutting off the upper nozzles. It could be trying to direct the airflow towards the crop. So, you know, while maybe not ideal, there's some things that definitely could be done in this situation to reduce the chances of drift. So what's the difference between overspray and drift? Now, overspray is when the pesticide is directly applied outside of that target area, you know, the area that you're intending to spray. So for example, if you're burning the sprayer and you get to the end of the row and turning around to go down the next set of rows, not turning that sprayer off in that headland area. And this is actually easily avoided. Obviously, the best thing to do would be to turn the sprayer off after you've reached the end of the row. So now drift, by contrast, is when the air currents are gonna carry that pesticide out of the target area. And in this case, it's more difficult to control. As much as I'm sure you would love to control how fast the wind is blowing and which direction that wind is blowing from, it's, it's not really an option. It's not an option at all, actually. So it's more difficult to control. So there are some things we can think about doing to try to minimize the chances for that pesticide drifting off of the target area. So let's talk some about the problems with drift. And I'm sure you've probably thought about this in the past, and it's quite possible some of you had situations with drift that you've had to deal with before. So from the applicator's perspective, the first thing that could happen is you could be faced with legal action. One of the first legal actions, you might have a complaint filed against you with the Environmental Conservation Department and get a visit from one of the friendly state uh, pesticide control officers. And so that means they could come in ask questions, look at how you were spraying at that time, might even take some samples and you know, swab, swab trees and might swab other, other areas around the, uh, around the vineyard to see what happened and do some testing. And potentially from that, you could be cited. You could receive a citation with a fine attached to it. It's possible that if you had a drift situation where you caused another crop to be unmarketable, you might be sued in civil court for that, for the placement value of that on, on the unsaleable crop. So there's could be some legal implications. Similarly, that if you have a legal action, or if you have to pay out some sort of a settlement, you know, naturally you're probably going to put that uh, expense to you know, file that expense through your insurance. So if you keep in, you know, claiming insurance claims, making insurance claims, then that potentially will lead to an increase in insurance premiums. And then additionally, it could also lead to strained neighbor relations. You know, some of these pesticides have dyes and are very visible when they drift off target. So just that visual application, you know, that visual situation alone might also lead to issues. Uh, if you continually have that spray drifting off into the neighboring you know, homeowner's yard and things, that, that relationship is going to be strained. And while I say a homeowner, it could also be a neighboring farmer. So you have to be careful about that as well. So as far as harm to others, we have to think about with drift, you know, there's the potential for damage to non-target plants. You know, in the vineyard, primarily you're spraying insecticides and fungicides, but you do apply herbicides. So what happens if that herbicide drifts off target into a neighboring crop or into a neighboring area? You know, we're facing that issue where the herbicide is going to cause harm to a plant. We also have to think about the drift creating illegal or unwanted residue on any neighboring crops. And as I'm sure you're well aware of, any pesticide that's used to produce food has to have a maximum residue level established or a tolerance, as EPA calls it, before that pesticide can be used on a crop. So in a situation where you're spraying a product that drifts over onto another crop that has no tolerance established for that, that insecticide or whatever pesticide it is, it makes that crop unmarketable. So therefore, there'd be an illegal residue in that kind of crop could not be used for food production or put into the food system. All right, especially if you're thinking of a, a neighbor that has uh, organic farming and you're using conventional non-approved pesticides for organic production, again, you're creating a situation that could make their crops unmarketable. So let's talk about the two different types of drift. The first one is particle drift and then also vapor drifts. So when we think about particle drift, that's where those actual pesticide particles are drifting off the target. You know, when that picture I showed you at the start of the presentation, that cloud, that is moving across the, across the field. 
that is an example of what particle drift would look like. And typically, particle drift is only going to affect those areas near the application site. And so what affects the uh, particle drift? Well, first, we have to think about the spray droplet size. And this is probably the most important feature of managing drift. So if we think about the size of the particle, the smaller droplets are the ones that are going to tend to blow off of the target application site, right? By contrast, if we have a larger spray droplet, those are more likely to stay on the target area. However, if we're thinking about the effectiveness of the application, if we have a droplet that's too large, it potentially could run off the target plant. It may not be effective at all. If we think about wind speed, uh, a lot of the vineyards I've been in in Western New York, there's constantly a wind. Any, any locations that are near one of the large lakes, wind is always going to be a factor. So if we think about wind speed in situations where that is a you know, higher wind speed, you know, gusty winds, more likely we're going to have a situation where drift will be uh, a possibility. Contrast, you know, in slower wind conditions, you'll have less of that chance. If we think about the nozzle height, if we're looking at a boom sprayer off the ground or the nozzle distance from the sprayer to the actual vines, you know, increasing that distance is going to create a situation that has a higher potential for drift. So in the case of a boom sprayer, if we're setting that nozzle height too high, we're giving much more of a chance for wind to come in and actually blow those droplets off of the target area. Similarly, in, in the video canopy, if we're not directing that spray towards it or keeping the nozzles as close as we can to you know, still maintain an effective application, we're increasing the potential for drift. You also need to think about temperature and humidity. In, in days where it's very dry, very, you know, very warm, the chances are that that droplet size is going to, to decrease in size with that temperature. And so if the humidity increases, we have less likely of a chance of that happening. And because the temperature affects the droplet size, it's possible that those droplets could evaporate and shrink enough that they will be very drift prone. So we have to keep that in mind as well. We think about air stability, and there's a few ways to look at air stability here. The first, if you think about horizontal or lateral mixing, so that's what we common, you know, commonly think of as the primary focus of, of drift management. And that's where that, that spray is going across the horizon or across the field of vineyard. We also have to think about vertical mixing. As during the day, if we have you know, plenty of sun, we end up heating up the ground surface and we create those vortex situations where the spray is actually being brought up into the upper atmosphere through those convection currents. And then there's a situation where there's still air. You know, sometimes people will think that spraying in still air is the ideal situation, and well, probably it really isn't. And for one reason is, is that those droplets can actually remain suspended in the air and then move off target when a sudden wind gust comes up. And one of the recommendations I mentioned to people is that it's probably actually better to spray when there's a little bit of wind, primarily because the wind speed can be documented and the direction of that wind can be documented. So in case there's an issue down the road, you'll have that, pr that, that, that uh, proof that these are the situation, the condition that we were spraying in. Air temperature inversions, I'm sure some of you have heard of these. They're actually becoming more of an issue primarily with herbicide use. And so air temperature inversions, there's a good publication from North Dakota State University that you may want to check out and the URL to reach that publication is listed here on the screen. But air temperature inversions are another situation we have to pay attention to simply because it doesn't really work the way one would think. And in the old days, I would talk about air temperature inversions as being this layer of warm air sandwich between cold air. And that was kind of a gross over, over generalization. And so there's been some research done looking at what an inversion is and how they actually behave, and especially how it relates to drift. This is a very complicated diagram, but the idea here is to understand that in a temperature inversion, what happens is that the air temperature at the surface starts to increase as we go higher in the atmosphere. Normally, as you go higher in the atmosphere, the temperature decreases, right? So in this case, that temperature is going to increase up to a certain point, and then at the top of that inversion, the temperature will start to decrease, which is our normal expectation. So what the take-home message is here is that this inversion intensity is that difference between the air temperature at the ground surface and then where the air temperature starts to shift about that eight or 10 feet up, what that distance is there. So if that's really tight, 
that's going to have more of an inversion intensity. And one of the things that's been found from temperature inversions is that the airflow throughout that inversion is only going to be vertical or horizontal, excuse me. There's no vertical motion or up and down. So the concern is, is that what happens is if you spray in these situations, those droplets are going to continue to move across the horizon. All right. So what we have to also keep in mind too is that Sometimes pesticides are going to require to look for these inversions. So again, going back to making sure that you're reading the pesticide label for information about drift management. So that was a little bit about what, what uh, particle drift is. Let's shift a minute and talk about vapor drift. So vapor drift occurs when a volatile pesticide changes from a solid or liquid to a gas. And that can happen anytime. That can take place at the time of the application it could be several days, maybe even weeks later. So it's not an immediate uh, thing that happens. We also need to remember that vapor drifts may move farther than spray droplets. They can travel several miles and possibly even longer you know, further down, downstream, downwind, than a spray droplet can. And in situations where if you're using a, a volatile herbicide, you know, some of the examples that are mentioned are dicamba or 2,4-D esters, those are sometimes specifically problematic you know, because they, they volatilize quickly, creating vapor and will be more prone to drifting off target. So what are the factors that are affecting vapor drift? You know, these are gonna be similar to, to particle drift. If we decrease that particle size, we're uh, uh, increasing the potential for evaporation, creating those really small ultrafine type droplets that are gonna drift off this application site. To think about higher temperatures again, kind of the increase in vapor drift. And then a little bit different than particle drift, if we're applying in wet soils, wet soils are going to degrade that pesticide faster and it's going to potentially increase the volatility, you know, speeding up the concern we would have with vapor drift. So up until this point, we're looking at what the two different types of drift are. So a question you should be asking is deciding when to spray. Now, now, there's nothing like answering this with a negative response, but the first rule is to know when not to spray, all right? So what we need to think about is assessing the site conditions before you mix. You know, one of the things that I, I hear about is people will mix a tank of spray, and then as soon as it's mixed, they need to spray it. You know, they want to store it, but then they need to spray that material out. So ideally, you should be out there looking for these scenarios before mixing. One, assess the weather, you know, taking a look at the forecast and making sure that there's no weather conditions such as wind speeds that are gonna be a problem or even the temperature inversion situation might be on its head. We also have to think about sensitive areas and looking for those areas downwind that could be affected by the spray application. You know, making sure that you're checking for fields that are planted to a different crop, you know, making sure we also understand on the labels that there may be some restrictions about spraying in areas where that drift could happen. Also thinking about the sprayer setup. You know, can we apply it with a coarser droplet size rather than a finer droplet? You know, is there a way that the sprayer can be uh, set up to reduce, you know, where, where the uh, air is flowing, you know, which nozzles are operating, things of that nature. So for assessing the, like, the risks of drift, you have to think about the likelihood for drift. So one of the questions you should ask yourself is how likely is it for that pesticide to drift into a sensitive site? Now, another question you could ask is what would be the adverse effects if that pesticide did drift into that particular site. Also keep in mind, what are those pesticide factors that could relate to drift? And so sensitivity could be in place here. You know, what about the herbicide damage to a non-target plant? You also have to think too that those labels that you, of the products that you're using may give restrictions on when you can apply that product. And there may even be a situation where it limits what wind speed that you can apply in, all right? So then you also need to think about the consequences. Do you know if the you know, application is gonna affect a down, downwind neighbor? You know, what would your neighbor think about that? You know, it's really hard to tell, but you know, it's always better to err on the side of caution. So basically you should assume that there's little tolerance for drift. So choosing not to spray. You know, this is me from the ivory tower here telling you that this is the ideal situation and it's probably not not as easy as it sounds, but choosing not to spray. You should not make that application if drift is likely and serious consequences are unavoidable or if you cannot adequately access those risks, all right? Easier said than done. It's gonna be really difficult 
to not spray in certain situations. You know, there's going to be certain timings and things like that to make adequate pest control. So in those situations, what can we do to widen that window to make the application? So the first thing to do would be to have adequate pest detection. And this gets to IPM. So scouting and monitoring for the pests, making sure that you can detect them early enough before you get into a situation where you absolutely have to spray. You know, the last thing we want to do is get back into a corner. The other thing to think about too is having a flexible IPM program. So if pesticides are included in the IPM program, you know, maybe have various options to select from. You know, one example is that if your first choice is too volatile for the conditions, you're not, not appropriate for the conditions you need to spray in, maybe going to a different product that's more acceptable in that situation. Also consider having buffer zones, that is keeping an area outside from the outer edges of the field not sprayed. And so those buffer zones are increasing the distance between the target site and any sensitive area that may be in an adjoining area. And so that means that you'd be able to spray a little bit wider wind situation. So when you choose to spray, like I said a minute ago, we can actually use equipment that is designed to reduce drift. All right, we'll check, check a few of those options out here in a few minutes. You can also use the lowest nozzle height to keep uniform coverage. In the case of spraying under the vines, you know, also making sure that we've got those droplets and those nozzles angled towards the, the vines themselves. You should also consider using the coarsest droplet size that provides sufficient coverage and will provide adequate pest control. All right, if you think about selecting a sprayer and some options to consider, you're looking at using a boom sprayer. You need to keep in mind that boom sprayers tend to produce larger droplets and that they're released closer to the target area. And also a boom sprayer can be built to reduce drift. So in this situation here, this picture here is a conventional boom sprayer. I realize this is a little bit larger than what you typically be using in the vineyard, but the concepts are the same. The same. Conventional boom sprayer, you can see that there's a lot of potential for drift here. Your nozzles that are set up on the sprayer typically will produce a finer droplet, you know, making them more susceptible to drift. So what can we do to try to avoid this situation? One option is possibly an air-assisted boom. And in this case here, this boom sprayer is set up with a, a, uh, there's a piping system that directs compressed air from a fan that's mounted at the back of the sprayer and is blowing that air down across the nozzle, very similar to what, how an air blast sprayer operates. And the idea here is that you're forcing those droplets down into the target. Another option too, and some of you may be using these in the vineyards, is the use of a covered boom or a hooded sprayer. And here are some examples. The top is the in-between row where the shield is covering the nozzle and the spray going between these two rows. We also have full width booms that can be covered with a cover type. There's one at the top here is an agricultural one, the one at the bottom left is from turf. And then probably you've heard about a tunnel sprayer. In this situation, there is a sprayer that's got a cover that goes over the top of the vineyard rows to recapture the spray. And those sprayers are actually really good at recovering the spray and minimizing the amount of drift. So thinking about mist blowers, which is closer to what most vineyard operations are using, you need to keep in mind that up to 90% of the spray droplets are going to be very fine or smaller. So that means they're going to be highly susceptible to drift. So in this case here, this is an orchard example, but classic air blast sprayer, a radio fan, we've got all the nozzles on. And as you can see, plenty of drift that's going way beyond the canopy, way up above the trees. So in this situation, what could we do to help reduce the chances for drift? One, maybe angle the shrouds over the top of that fan to direct that spray, you know, maybe adjust this spray nozzle so that they are directed more towards the tree than towards the vine in their case. Another option that we have is to actually construct the sprayer in a way that's directing that fan around the nozzle boom and then pushing the spray into the vine. In the case here, this is a, a vertical nozzle boom that's got a shroud connected to the air fan so that we're really trying to make a conscious effort to push those particles into the spray canopy. Another more elaborate option would be what's called a tower sprayer. And in this case here, it's very similar to the tunnel sprayer. We have the air is being directed around to the side behind those nozzles, those booms and nozzles, and are pushing that spray into the, into the row. In this case here, it's a, a two row type sprayer. 
And then just to show you another example, this is a hardy example. Same concept, you know, just a little, maybe a little, uh, you know, cleaner looking operation where we have the, the compressed air tubes that are designed to blow that air around the nozzles and able to direct that spray into the target canopy. Now, the other thing we can do too, in addition to managing the type of sprayer and the setup of the sprayer, is actually look at managing the size of the droplets that we're using. So you need to keep a couple of things in mind. One is that the droplets that are less than 150 microns. So micron is 1 25,000th of an inch. So these droplets that are less than 150 microns are more prone to drift. Now thinking even smaller, 50 microns in diameter are highly susceptible to drift. So how does this all look? So this chart here is a relative comparison between different droplet sizes. And if you can see the top here, we said around 50 microns is highly susceptible to drift. That would be you know, somewhere between the size of a human hair and the point of a needle. So pretty small size droplet size. So those are the highly susceptible to drift. Whereas we said 150 microns, a little bit larger, you know, if you want to think about it. rainfall events, kind of a fine grizzle droplet size, you know, quite a bit bigger, but still, even with that larger size difference, are still susceptible to drift. Now, keeping in mind what happens once you've sprayed out that droplet, here's a chart here that shows about the distance it's traveled. And this is only in a three mile an hour wind. So if we are looking at that, that 50 micron droplet size, so it's, it's highly susceptible to drift, we consider that a mist site type spray. That, that distance will be about 180 feet before that droplet hits the ground. Whereas if we increase that droplet size, let's say if we double that size, we're only looking at maybe about a 44 foot distance, right? So as you can see, that particle droplet size is really going to affect how far those droplets can travel. So the larger the size, the less likely they are to travel. Also thinking about spray pressure. So if we increase spray pressure, we increase the number of small particles, or what I like to refer to as fines that are in the spray. So you need to make sure that that pressure is set in a way that fits the product you're using and is suitable for the conditions that you're spraying under. Now the nozzle itself, so larger orifices in a nozzle, larger openings in a nozzle are gonna create larger droplets. Conversely, if we make that nozzle orifice really small, we're gonna create smaller droplets that are more susceptible to drip. We also need to think too that nozzles can be designed in ways to eliminate smaller droplet sizes and tend to go towards larger droplet sizes. And we're going to take a look at those here in a few minutes. If you think about the spray rate, and when I say spray rate, that's the amount of liquid that's being pushed out of that sprayer. So higher volumes, you know, I believe in vineyards, you're probably spraying in the 200 to 350 ish range, you know, pretty large volumes of gallons per acre. So in those cases, you can have a larger nozzle orifice because you're applying much more spray volume per acre. By contrast, some of the field crop growers that I work with, they're only spraying 14 gallons per acre. So they're using extremely small nozzle sizes with extremely small droplet sizes by comparison. So if you have the opportunity to adjust to a larger droplet size, potentially change that, that spray rate, that volume you're applying, rather than spray pressure. So since spray pressure is going to increase the potential for drip. There's also some drift reduction agents out there, and I will be open and honest that I'm not an expert in drift reduction agents or adjuvants, but they are out there. And one of their intentions is to help make the droplets larger and to make sure that, that they, you know, they're going to be in a size that is less prone to drift. Now, the caveat with this as well is that you'll want to double check the product labels to see if there's any required adjuvants. It's possible there may be some adjuvants for drift reduction required in the drift management section of the label. Now, speaking of labels, labels also may affect the nozzle selection. And so there are some situations where the nozzle or the uh, labels may specify the droplet size classification, you know, how large or how small that droplet can be. It also may get so specific as to tell you which nozzle you can use on the application. So here's an example here. I'm sure some of you have already read the Movento label. I believe it's a fairly common product that's used for insect management from grapes. So if we read through the label, of course, you're all label experts. And so labels are an adventure to read in their own right. 
But if you dig down deep enough, you will see a section in the Movento label that talks about droplet size. And of course, they state the obvious that the important factor of influencing drifts is droplet size. And so they tell you to select nozzles in a pressure that create a medium spray droplet is indicated in the catalog or in accordance with the ASAE standards S572. And then it further tells you that talking about coarse droplets may be used to reduce spray drift by increasing gallons per acre, like we just mentioned. And then talking about applications above the canopy, you know, certain distances to avoid, and all that general information. But the one thing I wanted to draw your attention to is this, this statement here about selecting nozzles and pressures that deliver medium spray droplets based on this ASAE standard. So you're probably saying, what is the ASAE standard? Well, what this is, and in fact, the organization has changed names since that label has been written. But ASAB is the American Society of Agricultural and Biological Engineers. And they're an organization of people that work in the egg engineering profession. Uh, a lot of equipment dealers, equipment designers, they're members. And so they've developed a standard to assess what droplet sizes are emitted by spray nozzles. And so they've created this standard, it's that 572. And so using laser analysis, every nozzle manufacturing company has to determine what type of droplet classification their nozzles are producing. And so basically this, this scale runs from a range of ultra coarse, which is very large, 650 micrometers, or larger is the approximate size range. And this is based on the average volume median diameter, that middle size spray droplet. So it ranges from 650 micrometers down to as small as less than 50. All right, so extremely fine range. One thing to note too, is that there's a symbol that's used to represent these different classifications. And then there's also a standardized color coding. And this standardized color coding is only something that's used in the United States. I believe over in Europe, they have their own system. So this would pertain to products that are developed in the United States. So if we look further to see how this looks in our droplet size comparison here, this extremely fine is actually off the chart. And then if we go down through ultra course, it would be considerably larger, almost like if there was a thunderstorm. So you can see it's quite the wide range that this droplet classification is specified. So keep that in mind. If you see that on a label, you'll want to make sure that you keep this chart in mind. So if it talks about medium or coarse nozzles, this is the standard that those labels are referring to. Now, I also mentioned that labels can be very specific on, on nozzle requirements. Now, this example is not from the vineyard industry from viticulture at all. If you've been following a lot of the, uh, the last few years with a product called dicamba, there's been a lot of concerns about drift from that use in soybeans down south in particular. The dicamba labels are now getting extremely specific as far as what types of nozzles can be used when they're spraying out those products. So this is from the Enlist Duo label. This is an example. This case here, this product Enlist, these are the only nozzles that you're allowed to use to apply this product. All right, so while well, this is an extreme example, it's just to raise the awareness that while you're reading through the labels, make sure you're looking to make sure there isn't some requirement for a certain nozzle type. It could be a certain nozzle size. It could be even a manufacturer and nozzle number, but make sure that you're looking for that when you're reading through the pesticide labels. Now in the nozzle catalogs, it's a good place to turn to to look for information about droplet sizes. So the thing to keep in mind when you're looking at those catalogs is that one nozzle, it's quite possible that it could produce different droplet sizes, particularly depending on the pressure that that nozzle is used at. So let's look at an example here. This is from T-Jet. Now I'm not favoring one company over another, it's just that T-Jet has a pretty good layout for their catalogs and the way they present information. So if you look at the T-Jet catalog, in this case here, this is a flat fan nozzle. You got the standard information about the, how many gallons per acre are being generated by that nozzle at a certain travel speed. But take a look over here on the left-hand side. If we look at the different pressures, you can see under the drop size columns that those droplet sizes actually change depending on the pressure. If we look at this ADO2 nozzle here, it's a 20 PSI pressure depending on the spray angle even, we can see that there's differences. So if we look at that, you can decide whether you want to use that nozzle to meet a certain droplet size classification or not. 
Um, one of the other things I wanted to point out too, that if you recall on my big chart earlier, there was the abbreviations. TJET has incorporated M for medium, F for volume. They've incorporated those abbreviations in addition to the color coding scheme. So if we go back to the ASEB standards, we look for the orange category classification coloring that would correlate with fine. Now, similarly, we can look at a cone jet nozzle, which is probably a little closer to what you're familiar with. In this case here is an example of depending on which size of the nozzle we're using and the pressure we're using, we can change that droplet size slightly depending on the pressure. For example, for the TX3 at a 30 PSI range, they're estimating and telling you that it's a fine classification. But if we bump the pressure up to 40 PSI, we're going to create a very fine, so even smaller droplets. So naturally, the higher the pressure, you would expect to see smaller droplets produced. And then here's an example to show you that on the other extreme, we can have engineered nozzles. In this case, it's a cone jet, what's called an air induction cone jet, where the pressure, even at higher pressures, the droplet sizes don't necessarily change a whole lot, but they can change. The thing to note here is that these are these extra coarse and very coarse droplet sizes. So there's extremely large droplet sizes on our ASAB chart. So quite a wide variety of what can be expressed in these charts. All right, I'd like to just stop for a second and check in, see if anybody's got any questions or comments they'd like to make at this point. So far, nothing is coming through in the Q&A section, but we can go ahead and allow folks to talk if they raise their hand or send me a message in the chat. I'm happy to open that the floor up. All right, this must be a very happy group today. <laughs> I like that. All right, then we'll keep, keep moving onward then. So let's talk a minute about nozzle selection and drift. So we're going to look at some of the common nozzles that are out there, and then we'll go into some of those more engineered nozzles, just to give you an idea of what this look like, looks like. You know, it's hard for me, being a statewide specialist, to accommodate unique situations. So I'm looking at all across the board, you know, different areas that you might get involved in spraying. So the first one we'll talk about is the extended range flat fan. And I like to refer to this as the general all-purpose nozzle, you know, very commonly available. It's out there for you know, front boom sprayers in particular. It typically come in at 80 and 110 degree fan angles. And so it's got a tapered edge pattern. So if you're using these under bonnets and stuff and using multiple nozzles and you know, spraying off larger fields, what have you, you know, and making sure that we have overlap. So we maintain that consistent balance. The issue is, is that they have a wide spray pressure range that they can be operated in, anywhere from 15 to 60 PSI. Typically, my understanding is most guys are using it around 35 PSI. And so Drift may increase over 30 PSI. So if you're using those higher pressures, you just got to be careful about that pressure setting. And if you're burning a higher pressure, you might need to think about using a different size droplet, a different size nozzle to accommodate for, for any drift concern. You can see here, in this case here, this extended range version at 15 PSI, we can see that there's a little bit larger droplet. At 60 PSI, we go to a finer droplet. So this is one of those nozzles that, depending on the spray pressure, is potentially going to cause smaller droplets. And you can make some very small adjustments as well. This is just a side-by-side, -side, so you can see the difference between the two different spray patterns. You can see on the left is the 80-degree angle. On the right is a 110-degree spray angle. Also, you can tell that there's a little bit of fine droplets in this, you can visually see that in those photos. A flight fan nozzle is another uh, fan nozzle that's out there. It's very low pressure operated, produces low drops at low pressures and small, you know, even you know, still has small drops at a higher pressure. The spray pattern is most uniform at that lower pressure zone. And in this case, you would need to have 100% overlap because it's a very inconsistent spray pattern. With these types of nozzles, you can reduce drift by 50% compared to the extended range nozzles. You know, it's just an option that's out there and it's going to depend on what type of spray situation you're using. A lot of times these are used in fertilizer applications, but they do have an application in pesticide applications as well. So here's the case here. We can look at that just at bottom section to see what the droplets, relatively speaking, would do. So fairly large droplet size. Hollow cone nozzles, now we're moving into something that would be useful in the vineyard industry. 
Polychrome nozzles it forms a round ring pattern. So the spray is around the outside in a circular pattern. The inside, there's nothing there. It has a wide pressure range, anywhere from 40 to 125 psi, and produces fine sprays. Yeah, so they're going to have more of a specialty type of use. Now, this could be such as contact herbicides, fungicides, you know, defoliants, things of that nature. So if we look here, this is what I was saying a minute ago. We have the spray pattern on the outside. It's a typical one. There's also a wide angle version designed the same way that spray patterns around the outer edge of the spray. The full cone is similar to the hollow cone nozzle, except that it has a solid round ring pattern. Again, pressure ranges is a little variable from 15 to 40 psi. These will typically produce larger droplets than the other type of hollow cone that we spoke of. And again, specialty applications. Again, Thinking about the droplet outfits, these are still relatively small, highly susceptible to drought. As we can see here, this is just that underside look to say, show that there's relatively small droplets over the course of that, that pattern. Now, shifting into droplet sizes that are nozzles that can be engineered to help change the droplet size. One example is the pre orifice are also called the turbo, which is a trade name that's out there, flat fan. This has a turbulence chamber built in. It also has the tapered edge, just like the standard flat fan. Again, uniform spray distribution means that about half, you know, half of the pattern has to be overlapped with the neighboring nozzle. A wide pressure range running from 15 to 90 PSI and tends to produce those large drift resistant droplets. And so I'll give you a cross sectional view here. That it has this pre orifice, and essentially, what that does is it lowers the pressure once the spray comes out. And when we lower that pressure, the idea is it's going to create these larger droplet size. Similarly, in the turbo example, we have that pre orifice, and then there's also a turbulence chamber to do exactly the same thing we lower that pressure and create a larger droplet size. And then, just so you can see what that spray pattern looks like, here's a picture of that. Obviously, it is back to the picture of the flat fan nozzle relatively coarse by comparison. So if you have an opportunity to use water sensitive paper, you can use that to look at what the droplet output is and get an idea of what the droplet sizes are. And water sensitive paper is you know, there's at least one company out there that manufactures this, that you can you know, put it in the, in the vines, you can you know, use you know, stick like a two by four up and dry past it to look at the deposition. But when it's exposed to water, we get the blue droplets. So you can actually see those droplet sizes comparison. In this case, the turbo T-Jet, you'd end up with a spray pattern like that. Compared to the extended range, you can see in both examples for the larger gallons per acre versus the smaller gallons, relatively larger droplet sizes by comparison, all right? So uh, Mike has posted a question. He says, does droplet size have an effect on coverage when it comes to grape clusters? Will fine droplet size adhere better to the round berries and corners or vice versa? Well, that's one of the things to think about is what are you treating? So in that case, if we're trying to penetrate that grape cluster, you're probably gonna want a finer drop. Because if it's too large, it's gonna hit the, hit the grape berry itself and it's gonna slide off. You know, the outside of the grape berry is kind of a waxy, it's a very slippery surface. And so, you know, trying to make sure that we've got that size set in a way that's going to penetrate and get to that target is important, right? So if you get it too large, it's gonna, Run off, run off the plant or off the fruit. If it's if it's too small, you know it might not it might actually make it to the target. You know it increases that risk for drift. So it's kind of a delicate balance. All right. So moving into a, another type of nozzle that's out there is called an air induction, or also venturi nozzle is another name that's been used. So essentially, what this is, it acts like a carburetor for those of you who are familiar with engine parts. It's, there's a, air is drawn into the nozzle and then is put into the liquid stream itself. And an example here at the top, you see on the side here, these little openings, these little ports. So this is really set up in a way that is drawing that air in and it's creating an air-filled droplet. So the theory is, is that it's producing a larger droplet that's gonna be less drift prone. Um, these can be used at relatively low pressures. I've had some growers tell me it's in, the, in the field crop side, if they're down 30, 35 PSI, I've also had some growers tell me they use them at 90 PSI. So extremely wide range of pressures. 
I've heard no complaints about their applications, you know, effectiveness of the application. Uh, you know, they seem to be working quite well. So if we switch over to see what this looks like in the cross section, we have the air intake along the side. And so then we have this mixing chamber, one that's also helping to reduce the pressure, but also mixing it with that air. And so then when that air flow drop comes out, the theory is, is that the larger drop comes out of the nozzle, and when it hits the surface that you're applying on, that droplet will shatter into smaller, finer droplets. So you get the benefit of the large droplet for drift reduction at the time if the, the drop is leaving the sprayer, leaving the nozzle. And then when it hits that target, you're getting effective coverage. So if we look at that in water sensitive paper, this is what an example would look like at the two different rates of five gallons per acre versus 10 gallons per acre. You compare that to the other two nozzles types we've talked about, the turbo T-jet, which would be the center paper versus the extended range. You can see that there's quite a large droplet range difference here. One of the other things I would point out too is that in these test cases, that the consistency that you know, the, how uniform the application is looks to be a little bit less with the air induction compared to the droplets or the nozzles that produce smaller droplets. So that would be something to consider too when you're choosing a nozzle. If we look at this boom set up here, where you can look at the sizes side by side, the air induction would be on the right here compared to the turbo T-jet or that, that uh, the second nozzle we spoke about. You can see that there actually is quite a bit of coarseness difference. The air induction has those larger droplets. The turbo still has some fines in it to be potentially driftable. Now, if we compare these to the extended range of the traditional nozzles, you can see visually there's quite a huge difference. You know, and this is in a five mile hour wind at a 40 PSA operating pressure. All right, so there is a way that we can actually engineer those nozzles to help create larger droplets. Now, as I mentioned in the example of the Inless Duo, where we're specifying certain nozzles, the whole point of their drift management strategy is to create ultra course. And that's where they're recommending these nozzles here, are these pre orifice air inductions. So it's combining that, that turbo T jet with the air induction into one. And so they're designed in a way that they produce large droplets, extra course. And it doesn't matter what their operating pressure is. In a low pressure, you know, 15, 20 psi, all the way up to 100 psi. And so these are going to have sort of a limited application. So mostly for the pre-emergent herbicides, maybe some systemic post-emergent herbicides, and maybe systemic fungicides. So if we look at what the cross-section of these looks like, again, we see this pre-orifice, that chamber that's reducing the pressure in the flow. We have the air induction port that's drawing that air in, and the mixing chamber is here. So we've got the best of both worlds, really, mixing those two nozzle types together. All right, so that was really what I wanted to talk about as far as drift. Yeah, just needs to give you some things to think about as you're going through reviewing this past year. If you've had any issues with drift, give you some things to think about moving into next year's spray season. But I'd like to open it up to see if anybody here has had any experiences with drift management and maybe share some ideas of how they were able to, to work with that or manage drift. So if you wish to share anything, feel free. I was going to say, Mike, if you'd like, I'd, I'd be happy to, to ask a few of our friends on the line to share their experiences. I guess they can pipe up if they'd like to, but um, I know we've got a few board members and ex-board members on the line that I know have a lot of experience here. So happy to have them share, or if um, folks are ready to move on, happy to do that as well. Oh, I haven't mentioned spare calibration. No, I did not mention spare calibration. Mm -hmm. uh, the spare calibration, it, you have to take that into consideration. If you're thinking about the label, for example, is giving you a certain droplet size. So you're already going to have to stick with a certain um, drop, you know, a certain nozzle anyways. So that's going to affect your calibration as well. All right. So you have to make sure that you've got that nozzle selected before you begin the calibration procedures. 
All right, so the next uh, is inverted funnel can be used in a handheld weed sprayer to reduce herbicide drift. Yes, I've actually seen some attachments very similar to that that can be used on handheld sprayers. Yeah, so all, all of these principles would even pertain to the handheld sprayer. Obviously, I didn't talk about that specifically, but the principles in the mitigations are the same. And then the question, what is your opinion on using towers to reduce drift? Um, from my experience, which is relatively limited, that it's, they seem to have their place. I mean, it's, with the tower, there's a way that you can direct that spray into the target. You know, it's a little more controlled. It may be a little more mechanical work that you have to do to get those get those droplets put into, into place. I think being able to direct that spray to, towards the target to minimize the chance of that of particle drifting off is, is important. Good questions, good comments, thanks. Got a comment in the chat section. Um, just I've changed flow rate to as low as 20 gallons per acre in early seasons. You can see that there. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. High 60 at full canopy late. Yep. Yeah. So that, that's a good point to make too. That one of the things is that being able to adjust the volumes and even the airflow that you're putting out of those sprayer, depending on the vine growth stage, you're not going to want to spray at high volumes at high high air volumes even early season when there's nothing to really target other than pretty much a bare vine. And then like Mike was saying, that increase that as you go along through the season. Yeah, very good management point. Thanks. All right, I don't see any other questions or comments. It sounds like everyone's being very reserved to speak up online today. So I think we'll move into our next topic. Yeah. All right, so now let's shift gears entirely and talk about pesticide applicator record keeping. So applicator record keeping is extremely important, right? So probably the obvious one is it's a management tool. And I would trust that, that everyone that's on, on the call today is keeping records in some form, you know, either from a pest management standpoint and the application records as well. So it's a management tool. It's really able to have you track what you've used, how much you've applied, and using it as part of an IPM program. You also might have a situation where there's a processor or a broker that has you know, requested that you keep these spray records. So, you know, it's documented that these are the materials I have sprayed on this crop. You know, some, some processors don't accept certain materials. So this is a way for them to see what's been used throughout the year. It's also a way for legal protection. Like I mentioned earlier, with the drift management, if you're talking about recording wind speed and wind direction, you know, if there was a complaint about drift, you know, you've got a document that will say, hey, look, on this date this time, this is what the, the conditions were. It also helps you as far as documenting what you've actually used in case someone's questioning you as well. And then probably the reason why I'm talking about this here is to talk as to comply with laws and regulations. So there are actually two different groups we're going to talk about as far as who requires records. And so first is in New York State, the Department of Environmental Conservation, they have a record keeping requirement. And probably you didn't realize that the United States Department of Agriculture also has specific record keeping requirements. And let me just say that when I'm talking about record keeping requirements, the legal requirement is only for when you're using a restricted use pesticide. So that's why you need to be a certified applicator to use or supervise the application, all right? So if we first look at New York State, in New York, uh, application records are required by law. So in the environmental conservation law, it actually stipulates that private applicators need to maintain records. Those records are required for all restricted use pesticides. And so when I say all restricted use, that means those that are considered restricted use by EPA or what we refer to as federally restricted, and also the New York state restricted. So those are products that normally would be general use in other states, but in New York state, you have to have an applicator certification to purchase and use them, right? So any restricted use pesticide has to have a record kept for that. Now, this is where we're going to get into some interesting uh, diversions. In New York State, the DEC requirements for applicator records is that you have to document the restricted use pesticides that are purchased, the crop treated by the restricted use pesticide, 
the application method that was used, so it could be boom sprayer, hand sprayer, or whatever the application method is, and then the date of the application. All right. So I'll ask the question, just having that record, that legally mandated set of records, would that help you make decisions down the road? Probably not. But this is what's on the books and required in New York State. So from the New York's perspective, when you complete those records, those records need to be made immediately after application. And as it has been explained to me, if you don't make them immediately after application, then you have a visit or someone asks you to see those records, how can you actually show them what you have done? So those records need to be made as soon as the application is completed. Those records must be kept on file for at least three years. You, know, you can keep them for longer than yet, but at least three years of records is required. And they need to be legible. There isn't a specific uh, standard format. There is a form that's out there that the DEC has. But as long as you've got those components and you can present them in a legible manner, they've met the legal requirements. Now, as I said, the United States Department of Agriculture also has record keeping requirements. And where this comes from is back in 1990, the Farm Bill that year created the federal record keeping requirement. And these records from USDA's perspective are only for federally restricted use. So that means one of these uh, pesticides, the EPA, is classified as restricted use. And that's the product that will have the big box on the top of it, the label that says for restricted use pesticide. Those are federally restricted pesticides. So from the USDA standpoint, that's what their focus has been. And there are certain required elements that USDA wants you to record. There's, again, there's no specific form. I remember going through the training several years ago that people at USDA told me that we've seen records on the back of napkins and that suffice, as long as all of the pieces that are required can be presented upon inspection. And so here's what the USDA requires. And they're asking me to keep track of the name, the applicator certification number, the application date, location of the treatment, a very specific block, you know, if you've got a street address, things like that the brand and product name, the EPA registration number for that product, the crop or the site that's been treated, the total amount of the pesticide applied, and that's not the rate, that's how much actual pesticide was applied. If I poured four quarts out of the gallon and applied that over the area, that was four quarts applied. And then also the uh, record the size of the area or the number of units, you know, if you happen to be in a nursery situation, things like that. What were the number of areas or the size of the area that was treated? So as you can see, USDA has quite a bit more detail in their records. And one of the things that USDA also allows for are what's called spot treatments. And these are slightly different record. And this is where the spot treatment would be an application of a restricted use pesticide to less than one tenth of an acre. So it's not a huge area. And so these applications would not apply if you happen to have a nursery or a greenhouse when you're growing things. So this wouldn't have pertained in the greenhouse and nursery, you have to do the full set of records. So in the spot treatment case, these are the elements that would be required, the date of the application, the brand name of the product, the registration number, how much was used, and then just noting that it was a spot treatment, and then a description of where that spot treatment was made. Okay. So USD is a little bit different in their expectations for when to complete it. These, they say to record, the records need to be recorded within 14 days of the application. And then the records must be kept on file for two years. You can see that's less than New York State's. Records need to be legible, obviously. So some similarities and differences here. So when you complete the records, they need to be completed for each field, the location, or the crop, or the commodity that was treated. So and from the USDA's vantage point, that you know, make sure you have that, that specific information documented. In the case of a tank mix, includes more than one RUP, or restricted use pesticide, then each of those must have a separate record so that it's known what's in that mix. And I would say the same would be true for New York as well. And so that's the case of tank mixes. So some differences, some similarities between the two systems. So the simplest thing to do is to include all the New York and USDA components is one record. We should also include all restricted use pesticides purchased and used. And then keep the records for three years because New York has the stricter standard. And then you know that we have to comply with the more strict requirements, be it state or federal. 
and then make that record immediately after the application. So as soon as the spraying is done, get that record into electronic records or a written record, whichever one that you're using on the farm. So as I mentioned, there's uh, the DEC has a sample record sheet out there that could be used. And so in this case here, this sheet complies with the USDA requirements, the current New York State DEC requirements, and then when you're complying with WPS, there's also some, some WPS notification and record keeping aspects of this as well. So if you're interested in using that is a record form that's available online directly from the DEC's website. And there's the URL there. You can go to the DEC's website and search for private applicator record keeping form. Uh, additionally, if you still want to use the, the written form, if you have a copy of the Cornell Crop and Pest Management Guidelines, we reproduce a copy of this form in the back of the book, so you can use that as a record form as well. Just to note, the DEC's form is actually a fillable PDF, so you can go in and type in the boxes and fill it in as necessary. Again, there isn't a standard form, so if you're using uh, Track Grape or any of those programs from the IPM program, those are designed to meet the record keeping requirements. And then if you have your own Excel spreadsheets or whatever database or other system, as long as you've got those elements to meet the legal requirements, you should be fine. And then on the back of this form is the restricted use pesticide purchase record. So they want you to know the date, the trade name that you purchased, and then also the registration number for that product. Now, having said that, uh, it's I don't know how widely known it is, but we're going to be going through a period of change in New York State when it comes to the pesticide regulations. Um, going back to 2017, the EPA had revised the pesticide applicator certification and training regulation, which is the first update to the regulations nationally since 1972. And so as part of that, updated the regulations. There are some new things that New York State has to comply with. And in the process of adapting to the new regulations, the DEC is now going to be revising all of the pesticide applicator use regulations on the books in New York State. And so stay tuned. There's going to be uh, potentially some more uh, stakeholder meetings. Uh, at some point, we will see official regulations, draft regulations published for public comment. So keep your eyes out for that. Our program is going to be in tune with that, and it will probably be providing some outreach activities related to those. One thing to keep in mind is that as part of this process, and this came out in some initial DEC stakeholder meetings, as far as record keeping, the DEC is looking at amending those rules. And so they're going to expand what the required record details are. And in case here, they're looking to include the date and the time for the application starts and ends. The physical address and description of the treated area, which is very similar to a commercial or for higher applicators already have to do. They're looking at adding in an active ingredient record keeping requirement, documenting the restricted entry interval for the products used, and then also documenting wind speed and direction. As I say, these are just preliminary uh, ideas. I have to stay tuned to see what happens when the official uh, regulation is posted for public comment. And don't ask me when that's gonna be. It could be quite a while from now. So that's all I wanted to present today. Um, this is my contact information. If you have any questions after you're done today and you wanna catch up with me or you need some more help or you need some more information, by all means, feel free to reach out to me. So with that, I would open it up to any questions or comments the group has. Yeah, I think we have some questions or some comments that um, are in the Q&A section. And I also know that Todd from New Vines um, would like to chat with you um, so I can unmute him whenever you're ready. Okay. Yeah. So in the Q&A, there is a, a link to smartapply.com. It's a record keeping app. So there are some other applications out there that can help with record keeping. And again, just as long as you're meeting those required uh, fields, that's, that would be great. Okay, great. All right. So Todd, I'm going to give this a go. Hold on one second. All right. You should be allowed to talk. Okay. You got me? All right. Looks like you're on, Todd. You are unmuted. Try that one more time. Do you, do you hear me now, Val? Yes, thank you. Okay, all right. Um, this is in, in uh, respect to our sustainability certification, item number 1.1.3, which deals with uh, pesticide record keeping. 
And um, I mentioned this to Justin, we all kind of keep records our own way. And the things that you've pointed out, Mike, are pretty critical as far as what type of records are kept. I'm wondering if there isn't a universal template that we all could use that would uh, make this certification a, a best practice easier to accomplish. I'm not aware of one. It's quite possible I'm not to put anything back on the association. Maybe that is a consideration as a part of the program. Sure. Uh, I know the DEC form, from my perspective and my understanding, meets the legal requirements, you know. And as, of course, it's going to have to change the regulations change. But yeah, that would be that would be a good idea, good suggestion. And we're happy to send that link over to the DEC form. I guess if there's, you know, we can talk to Justin and maybe we can reach back out to you, Mike. If there's anything that we can do to kind of make that either better as far as, you know, you see improvements that are needed that we can then put out for the rest of our, our program participants so that we can say, hey, look, this is what we recommend. We know it's legally compliant, but also includes, you know, other things that we'd like to see in our program. Does that make sense? Mm hmm Okay, great. Makes perfect sense. And I, I, it's been a while since I've looked at it. Um, you might also want to investigate through the New York State IPM program. They they have a software program called Track Grape. Yeah. I'm not exactly sure how frequently it's being updated. I think it's designed now so that it can be customized by the user. And I believe that's based on Excel. It includes all these elements. And I believe they even have some processor uh, tabs as well included in that. You know, if you're shipping grapes. Right. And I know Mike um, has uh, some inside scoop on, we are working on some things, I think with some other technology solutions that might come into play with the program uh, as well. I didn't know if Mike wanted to speak, but I know he put something in the chat. All right, Todd, are we all set then? Yes, thank you, okay. I appreciate that. All right. Great, all right. Any other questions or anybody want to uh, chat with Mike? Now's your time, free consulting. I couldn't have done that good a job. <laughs> All those questions. But like I said, you know, afterwards, if you feel like you'd like to, to contact me directly, that's fine as well. Well, that's also the thing. So I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording now, but do a little um, kind of housekeeping. Hold on one second. Let's go ahead and we'll stop the recording. <laughs>